Hi, my name is Brian Taylor. I'm a principal engineer at Optimizely, and I'm excited to talk to you today about the adventures and learnings I had while trying to understand and deeply measure latency. So first, a little bit about me. I am an engineer at Optimizely. Over the course of my career, I've had the opportunity to build two languages and a database, all for legitimate business reasons. Uh, I was told as an undergrad that this would never happen, no one ever does that. Surprisingly, I got a chance to do that. Because of that experience, I love performance problems. I love digging deep into the system, how it works, and really solving the tricky, deep problems. And so performance people are my people. I'm really happy to be here. I'm married. I have three little kids. The oldest is 10. And we all enjoy RVing around the country, really taking advantage of remote work as it exists now. So why is measuring latency so hard? Superficially, this seems like it should be easy, um, but the system is stacked against you in a number of ways. First, the clocks you might use to measure that latency often aren't coordinated with each other at all. Um, frequently, you don't have latency requirements, and so getting deeper into the latency measurements you can't really do without requirements, and so that stalls you. And frankly, the whole of our field, uh, the ecosystem around latency is really garbage. Most of the tools you pull off the shelf will do the wrong thing the wrong way, and so you're kind of on your own. But the main issue I want to talk to you today about today is coordinated omission. So to dive into that, let's start with a simple example. What is this code measuring? We pull some information off a queue, we start a timer, we do some kind of operation, maybe it takes significant time, maybe not, and then we stop our timer and record the latency measurement. And then we send the result back to the user. So pictorially, the thing we're measuring is how long it took to do that kind of internal thing. We are not measuring how much time the request spent in the input queue waiting to get to us. We're also not measuring how long it took for our result to get back to the user. So we're doing a great job of measuring our internal component, but we have no understanding at all of what the user is actually experiencing. So how do we dig deeper and actually get a sense of user experience? A obvious first thing to do is to step outside the system and build a load test. So this is a load test that starts a timer, fires a asynchronous request into the system, and when it gets a successful response, it records the latency for how long that request took, and then it waits a little while before it sends in the next request building a, a constant request rate test. So what is this thing measuring? Well, here we get subtle, and we need to understand what's actually going on inside that asynchronous request. So we are definitely measuring a good chunk of that input queue. We're measuring how long it takes to do the work, and we're measuring how long it takes the, the answer to come back. Uh, but what we're potentially not measuring is what our load test does when it comes under resource constraints. So for example, that asynchronous uh, emit of the request probably went through a connection pool. What happens, is, what happens when that connection pool is exhausted and there's no more connections available? Uh, some systems, the system I used, what it did is it dropped the request immediately with an error. And so whenever that connection pool got full, there was a big spike in errors. And in my case, I actually wasn't measuring the errors at the time, so I didn't notice it. Um, hopefully you do better than I did. Another thing a system can do is instead of dropping the attempt, the system can block and wait for a resource to become available. Both of these solutions lead to the problem of coordinated emission, and I want to show you how. So regardless of what you did, remember the goal of this test, this constant throughput test, was to, at a regular interval, keep requests flowing into the system. When it exhausted its resource, it broke that contract and it started making weird measurements. You know, so in the case of just dropping the attempt, we never measure the latency at all, and we just throw away when that weirdness was happening. Um, if instead we blocked, we would measure that, uh, that delay in the blocked request, but all the requests that come after it wouldn't happen, and so we would miss all those measurements. And you end up with a time series plot that looks like this, where when the system has a pause, 
you get a little spattering of bad measurements that is brief, looks like no big deal. You might call it noise if you looked back at your uh, latency history, and then everything's immediately back to normal. I confess I have looked at many plots that look just like this and concluded nothing was wrong. Like that spike, that's just noise, crap happens, what you're gonna do. But what actually should have been measured is this. You know, so we had that period where the system was doing nothing at all, requests were logically piling up, and then eventually the system breaks free, it starts processing requests again, whatever was waiting the longest ends up with the largest latency, whatever's next is a little lower, and eventually the system burns down the backlog of requests and catches back up. So this is what a user actually experiences, because a, a user is not a load test, you have millions of users and only a handful of load tests. Like their connection pools aren't getting full. They don't have the, the measurement problem your load test does. They see this. So the way you tackle this problem, one way to tackle this problem in code is to, instead of deciding your start time as you're running the test by measuring your clock, you preordain all your start times at the very beginning of the test. Like you already know that this is a constant load test they should come at a constant interval. So based on the just the index number of the measurement you're running right now, you know when that measurement is supposed to go out. And so you just declare that measurement goes out at that time, whether you manage to get it out then or not. So here we calculate the start time. If we happen to be keeping up or ahead of schedule, we wait a little while until it's actually that time. And we do a check then to make sure that when we fire this request, it's actually going to immediately go out. If that's not true, we need to record that something is screwed up in this test, just you know, so you know when you analyze it later, this test is suspect, and then we need to fire that request into the system. So that's what this does. Now, finally, we are measuring everything. From the user to the output, we know what the user is actually going to experience. All right, that was weird, that was hard, why do we bother? If you, instead of looking at that sequence of latency measurements as a time series, we look at it as a latency spectrum and see how frequently different latencies happened, this is what you see. So in our broken test, you see in a latency spectrum plot a wall at some point. You know, so we generally, like the test looks perfect and then it just goes to hell um, if your test is broken. If you fix the problem, as I described before, what you instead get is this gentle curve. That's a significant difference. To drive that home, we can overlay a latency requirement on top of this plot. So now this is the requirement of 99% of the time, the latency shall be less than 100 milliseconds. If we have this requirement and we run the broken test that is the dark blue line, it looks like we pass. Like this looks great. We're happy, we ship it, we all go home. But if we had measured it correctly, we would actually see we're missing that requirement by a mile. We, are, we stop hitting that requirement at one nine and we're supposed to hit it at two nines. So we are way off, we're lying to ourselves, we screwed up. This is why you care. Now that was all theoretical. You know, that was conjured data, but realistically obtained. But now I wanna dive into a real system, real life, and show you what this means when you actually do it. So the system we're looking at here is an asynchronous data pipeline. The user feeds data into the system, makes an HTTP request. Once the system has persisted the data, it asks the user back and they go on about their lives. Then the system copies that data into Kafka. Uh, downstream, a tool mirrors Kafka into a different Kafka cluster. And then a little later, we enrich the data. We can actually measure the latency at every step of this pipeline and learn a lot about how the system's operating. So again, this is real data, no measurements. So this is the view from the user. This is how long it took the system to acknowledge that it has received the data. And here we see pretty flat performance, at least at this scale, and then a significant diversion at two nines. The shape of these curves, you see a, a hump, and then you see another hump after it. Since you see double hump, humps, you can be very confident that this is actually a queuing behavior. So this is a, a clump of data arrived. The system maybe slowed down a little bit, more data piled up. This is queuing. 
Uh, because I know that queuing looks like this on a latency spectrum plot, I know what I need to go look for. In this case, I probably just need to scale up. The next phase is the system takes that data, copies it into Kafka. This was the first point where I got surprised. You know, so we have pretty flat performance, again, at the scale, and then a hump, and then a wall. Now, I hopefully sensitized you a little earlier to seeing walls and thinking, ha, ah, that's probably coordinated omission. In this case, by design, I know this is not coordinated omission. The other thing that can look like a wall on the latency spectrum is a mode change, where the system was kind of running in fast mode and suddenly switched into slow mode for some of its processing. That looks like a wall on the latency spectrum. Now, I happen to know in this case what the mode change is, but I was surprised by this plot to see how frequently it happens. So next we have the step that copies the data from one Kafka cluster to another, and this is where I was shocked. I did not expect queuing to be making a significant impact to latency at this stage, you know, 10% of the time. You know, so we're, we're starting to see deviation from where I wanted things to be at 1.9. Things are going sideways at 2.9s, getting worse at 3.9s. Again, this is the humps that are characteristic of queuing. This is probably a scaling problem. I know what to go do about it, but I, I had no idea I had a problem here at all. But then, oh my gosh, this is where I was shocked. So from this system, I expected queuing, just queuing. It's a pretty simple system. It reads data from Kafka. It does some manipulation. Uh, part of that manipulation involves reading data from Cassandra, writing data back to Cassandra, and then it writes the result to Kafka. And what we're measuring is input to output as the data flows through Kafka. You know, so I've got the queuing I expected, but I did not expect that wall. And again, I know by design, this is not coordinated emission. This must be a mode change. And so when I saw this, I started to get suspicious. You know, this is Cassandra. It goes through some serious slow spells. I know from its internal modeling or monitoring that sometimes its latency is at one level, sometimes it's significantly higher. I have theories about this being misbehaving garbage collection or uh, not good IO management when it's doing compaction. Um, but I, I know that Cassandra goes through mode changes. That looks like a mode change. Cassandra might be my problem. All right, so we've got information. We can get to work and we can go do something about it. Now it's pretty obvious from those plots going stage by stage where I can get the most improvement out of my system. I need to work on enrichment. So I know, I already know that enrichment is IO limited. I'm not going to scale enrichment out of this problem. When I saturate that system, I'm at fairly low CPU usage. Uh, IO is the problem. Cassandra is my likely culprit because I already know that Cassandra has bimodal latencies. And so my, my theory, now this is a Scylla conference, but not an ad for Scylla. My theory is if I fix those bimodal latencies, if I have a system that is more consistent, maybe I solve this problem. Uh, so we did a big migration of all of that data out of Cassandra into a modern version of Scylla, and then we did the measurement again. So you can see the queuing and mode change that we used to have, and now that's just pure queuing. So we've got very simple humps, it's pure queuing, uh, now when I measure my system, I, I see that I'm not IO bound anymore. I can scale my way out of this problem. Um, I wouldn't have known that Cassandra mode changes were ruining my day. Because if I, if I looked at most of my monitoring for Cassandra is just giving me average latencies, and those all look good. It wasn't until I really dove deep, understood the spectrum of what Cassandra was giving me and how my system was responding that I realized, wow, I've got a real problem here. So hopefully, I've started to convince you that even though understanding latency well is difficult, it's worth it. You've got the challenge, the key challenge I dived into, coordinated omission. You've got uncoordinated clocks. I also had to deal with that. And then again, the ecosystem is garbage. Most of the load generators that you'll just pick up and use suffer from coordinated omission. I don't trust any load generator until you've at least Googled the name of that thing and coordinated omission, because this is a pervasive problem. Most of our tools are garbage. 
Once you get through those challenges, though, there's a payoff. You get insight into how your system works. I, I went through with you three major surprises. I've been working with the system for years. I had no idea that that was lurking underneath. That led to better understanding, and then ultimately, through an invasive but simple to explain change, led to significant progress and a large improvement in our tail latencies. So, do good stuff. It's been great to talk to you. I'd love to keep the conversation going. You can reach me by email at brian at brian t. Taylor. Don't forget the T. Dot com. Uh, you can watch me not tweet on Twitter at netguy204. That could change. I'd love to chat. Uh, you can also read the Optimizely Engineering blog, uh, for which I'm a frequent contributor at the address there. And I'd love to keep talking with you in the chat now or later in the speaker's lounge. Thank you for your time.